no idea how perfect that song is. You're going to find out in just a few minutes. And um, I also wanted to draw your attention to the fact that the uh, congregational song, the lyrics were written by the great Janet Ryan. So, so isn't it wonderful to hear so many voices singing your song? It's beautiful, beautiful. And you sounded really good. So good morning, everyone. I'm Reverend Carol. This is a great, great day. I just got back from our convention in Las Vegas. I'm so glad that we don't have pulsing lights. And uh, although it was very, very fun. And I have a few photographs um, that will mean a, a great deal to um, a, a lot of you. So this is our theme for the year, uh, Your Joyous Life, and I'm feeling that already. So this, this one here is Reverend Dr. Marcia Sutton receiving the Doctorate of Religious Science, the highest honor she can receive. And this was the, for those of you who don't know, this was the minister before me. And uh, oh, the accolades that were given to her. They, they said, you know, her, her curriculum um, have been taught by every single minister in that room, you know, and, and she, doesn't she look beautiful and just so happy. And so I want, I took that picture. So that was just great. And this is John Waterhouse, the president of Centers for Spiritual Living. And this is Ken Gordon, the spiritual leader for the whole movement. So I, I'm happy with that picture. And then this was my roommate, uh, <laughs> Reverend Lanny. And uh, we had lunch at the Bellagio. And this is looking over onto uh, the Paris Casino. So um, we, had, we had a great, great, great time together. And then this one, uh, you can't hardly see this because this was the uh, logo for the whole convention, but this is Bob Gordon and I. And uh, Bob Gordon is on the legal team for our whole movement. And uh, we had a little bit of um, kerfuffle with uh, some amendments and um, uh, amendments to resolutions. And so he worked late into the night. and. Uh, at, with his legal knowledge, and the other, he is at the center, really, of the leadership of our whole movement because the people, the leaders at home office just say, Bob is a treasure. We could not do it without him. So he's a member here, so isn't that great? I wish he was here this morning. Yeah. So we are, uh, we are well represented. They know who the Golden Gate Center for Spiritual Living is, so there you have it. So uh, February has been about love, um, marriage, and other loving relationships. The theme of the month that we complete today is love is the self-givingness of God. And that's kind of a jargony way of saying in our um, philosophy that God makes everything out of itself. God is the one source, and you don't have to call it God. You can call it love intelligence. You can call it great spirit, whatever it is, but that one thing that one thing creates everything out of itself and gives and gives and gives and gives and gives all that we have forever and eternally. There's no lack of anything. If we have lack, it is because of our ability to receive. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. And we talk about that a lot. But um, God gives of itself all the time. The goal of the month is to increase love and see if that does not contribute to happiness. Happiness being the theme for the whole darn year. So our wonderful altar today is by Kareen Rosenblatt, this beautiful, simple altar of love. And uh, I want to tell you that she is a absolutely professional artist that sold a piece that has been on this altar this week for many hundreds of dollars this week. So th thank you for doing this for us, Miss Professional Artist Kareen Rosenblatt. Yeah. So my uh, no. my topic today is proof of love. So I want to begin by telling you a story about my children and I. So my children are off on their own, and every once in a while um, they get to be together. They live in different cities, but they fl uh, fly and visit each other and have a wonderful time. They love each other. And so um, whenever any of us flies, we always text <laughs> uh, on the plane uh, landing, and then um, so one of them will say, 
uh, I'm with Mel now, or I'm with Michael now, and I text back, prove it. And that means for them to take a picture and send it to me, and they know that. So that, that proof is incontrovertible fact. It is, there is no doubt that those two darlings are together. So that's what I want us to think about when we think about proof of love. It's incontrovertible. There's no doubt. There's an absolute sureness. There would never be any doubt. There's no debate. It's love. And everybody knows it. But love is so tricky, you know? It's much trickier than a photograph. Uh, because we've got this one word. It's so amorphous and vague sometimes, and who knows what it means. And we say that we love pasta, we love Hawaii, we love our pets, we love spring, we love uh, each other, but the variety of feelings that that word means uh, can make it misunderstood sometimes. And actually, the Greeks had it better than we do because they had three words for love. Um, agape is, uh, we say it agape, but the more correct uh, Greek pronunciation is agape, and that is uh, love of humanity, that just that open-hearted feeling of loving everyone. Uh, philios, which is brotherly love, um, and is the word that, uh, that was the origin of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And then there's Eros, and we all know what that is. So there's uh, at least three different kinds of love, which isn't nearly enough, right? We should have many, 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 many words for this. But um, in the book that we are uh, reading through this year, uh, Gretchen has something really nice to say, and that is, I have never forgotten something I read in college by Pierre Reverdy. There is no love. There are only proofs of love. And then she writes, Whatever love I might feel in my heart, others will see only my actions. So what this says is that the proof of love has to do with what you do, not what you say, or not necessarily what you feel, but what happens when you feel and declare love, what happens in the world. Scott Peck has my favorite definition of love in his book, the road less traveled. He says, I define love thus, the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Let me read that again. The will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. So what both of these statements from our author Gretchen and from Scott Peck says that proof of love has some elements of action in it, actually doing something. It has an extension of oneself. We have to like effort a little bit. We have to get out of ourselves and do something that we might not necessarily want to do in that particular moment for the good either of ourselves and or someone else to support their transformation or to support our own transformation. And that's what love is. So we're going to talk about proofs of love in three different ways today. The first is the proofs of love that we give. Now, I believe to make things simple, there are easy things that we give, easy for us, and there are difficult things that we give, difficult for us. And so I want, I have an example of each, of course, but I want you to think about your own life. I mean, you already know. You, um, Paula Yu, I don't think Paula Yu is here today, but one of the ways that she is now giving love and has for a number of years is baking. And that's easy for her, and it's wonderful for her, and it's wonderful for us because she brings baked goodies every time she shows up anywhere. Um, my children is texting me a picture. That's easy. You know, it does uh, provide a, a little bit of effort, I, a little bit of extension, and the result is that we are continuously weaving together our love in that web of relationship over and over and over and over and over again. And that's what happens every time you give anything, easy or difficult. 
But let's look at the difficult ones. The difficult ways of showing love is that it's not what you want to be doing right then. It is uh, effortful. It's inconvenient. And even though it's effortful and inconvenient, you choose nonetheless to extend yourself for the good of another. So the story for this happened this week uh, when I was at convention and Mary and Amanda were at home with the Cat family. Now the Cat family, the matriarch of the Cat family is Mab. Mab's an old girl. She's like 14. And she has suddenly found the huntress in herself. In the last two days, Wednesday and Thursday, she had already eaten two birds. Then this happened. This happened, and this is what is so hysterical. I'm reading you the exact texts that I got starting at dinner at about 7 o'clock with the clergy council. And I'm going, oh my God, because this is what I read. Oh my God, Mabby brought in a bat. It's flying around. I opened the door and turned off all the lights. I don't know if it went out. Mary is still screaming. <laughs> so then Mary writes, I thought it was a mouse until the little bat wing flared out of her mouth like she had a tiny Batman in there. Then when I shrieked, it's a bat, she, flew, uh, she let go and it flew around in circles. I hope it got out okay. So then we move on into the evening. And Amanda, in two separate texts, the bat is upstairs on the bookcase. So at this point, I text, poor everyone. But you know, I'm busy. So, uh, <laughs> so then Mary texts, yeah, I looked up on what to do online. I called animal control, closed. Called 911, according to animal control recording, they gave me a number for bat removal. <laughs> the woman who does this called me back and will be here in 20 minutes with ladder and nets. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and then Amanda writes, see what you're missing? And Mary says, why are you always gone when this stuff happens? <laughs> and I say, take pictures, me, I'm at the piano bar at Harris. <laughs> So then the bat, re bat remover comes. Who knew a career path of bat remover? So, so then Amanda narrates, her body is the size of a hazelnut. Hazel is now free to roam outside. She roosted on the books at the top of the stairs. Kathy from bat removal came and after much flying around by Hazel, her brown furry body is the size of a hazelnut, was snagged and released outside. Phew. Poor Hazel is going to have a lot to write about in her diary. <laughs> now, that is the most humane, effortful, dear ending that this story could ever have. And, you know, the next day, Melanie texted, I love it that Mabby is still so out there doing all this stuff, and Mary texted back and said, you can love it all you want, but we were here with a bat flying around our heads. <laughs> so it was, it was effortful, and it was loving, and you know, I bet you it contributed to bat consciousness, because <laughs> that little bat was scared, and now it's out there free. So when we look at this, the, uh, the different ways that we can give love, the easy way and the difficult way, any way we give love is great, right? It's a really good thing. But which would be better if we had to choose one? Isn't it like even better when we overcome a difficulty or a reluctance to give love and then we push through it and whoever is receiving the love really gets it, that we have broken through something that was difficult for us and loved anyway. That's what I want us all to do. Because I have times in my life when it's like, oh no, not, I'm not called to do this. And then when I do it, and it is so appreciated, and I feel so well used, it's wonderful. 
So the first part of this lesson is give all the time the love you have, which is un unlimited because God is giving that love through you all the time. Give it when it's easy and give it when it's hard. Okay? Say yes. Yes, Reverend. Okay. Yes, Reverend. Okay. <laughs> and I'll say that too. I'm going to do that too. All right. Proofs of love we receive from another. Now, of course, two of these too. There's the obvious ones we receive from another, and then the subtle ones we receive from another. So we'll have some stories about this. So the, the obvious ones, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the five languages of love. And if, if you aren't, uh, it, they're pretty easy. Um, we, when we act on, on love, we do it in five basic ways. Um, time spent with each other, uh, touch, words of love, giving of gifts, and acts of service. So I'll say that again. Time spent with each other, touch, words of love, gifts, and acts of service. Now when you think about these, you have your preferences. You have a preference of the way you want to give love and the way you want to receive love. So when your beloved or a friend or a family member knows what you like best and gives it to you, that's fabulous. And it really does also imply effort and extension and action for the purpose of weaving together a relationship. And when we are offered love in the form that is easy for us to receive, I really want us all to receive it with great gratitude. Just open our hearts and receive it. Because the other thing is, if we're closed off and stingy and don't receive it, then the whole love flow just kind of comes to an, a, a, an abrupt stop, even when it's obvious, it's obvious that our beloved or our friend or our family member is wanting to love us, they know us, they are giving us what we want, and we still are kind of stingy with opening our hearts, but we don't want to do that anymore, okay? Because we got to work on the subtle things that are, that are um, not so easy to receive. So the subtle ways of um, giving love, or we're on receiving love, the subtle ways of receiving love, um, a partner gives to you in a way that, you, that is not your receiving preference. It's kind of like I had a boyfriend once who changed the oil in my car, and it was very effortful for him. You know, it was, you know, I could have just taken the car to the dealer, you know, and, and he could have, you know, told me he loved me. But that was his way. It was subtler for me. So, uh, or another thing that might... Uh, impede your receiving of subtle love is you're already aggravated. You're, not, you're, you're aggravated and not receptive. Or you might be, I might be, too busy, distracted, unhappy, afraid, or closed to track that someone is wanting to love me. So I have another wonderful story about, this. Mary gave me this from the internet. <clears throat> this is about subtlety, bonding, generosity, and empathy, both in human and animal terms. My dogs, Titan and Socks, have an amazing relationship. Their love story began just under four years ago, and watching them interact makes even the most cold-hearted and jaded of humans believe in unconditional love. Um, it began in a strip mall in Fairfax, and there were a number of deserving dogs in need of a best friend. I was nervous. I already owned Titan, a very submissive puppy. I was afraid he would be rejected or worse, beaten up. I imagine I felt like parents do when taking their kids to school for the first time. I hoped he would have a good time and would be accepted by his peers, but I was afraid because I knew him to be kind of a pansy. It turned out Titan, while a bit of a chicken, is also quite the ladies' man. He spotted socks on the approach and made a beeline for her. Titan was in love. 
Still, I did my best to introduce Titan to as many dogs as I could. Picture speed dating on a leash. I talked, him, <laughs> I talked him through each encounter. What a pretty black lab mix. You guys would play all day. I didn't really care who we adopted as long as Titan was happy. He wasn't having it. He wasn't interested in the black lab mix or any other dog. It had been love at first sight. He had to have socks and kept pulling me toward her until I gave her the chance she deserved. Before I knew it, I too was in love with a bloodhound. <laughs> Socks was overwhelmed by all of the attention, but ultimately Titan and I took her home. To tell you I had never seen Titan so happy doesn't do their first day together justice. Delight, euphoria, bliss, and even adoration are words I would use to describe what he felt that day. Socks was confused but jovial. She had wandered the Virginia countryside for the first six months of her life and all of a sudden found herself in an entirely new environment. She had to learn to interact with humans, play nice with her new buddy, and navigate staircases in a home that she could not use as her toilet. <laughs> it was a lot to take in, but she made herself at home soon enough. Today, seeing them together sometimes takes my breath away. I oftentimes find them cuddling, even spooning. Socks is always the big spoon because she outgrew Titan somewhere along the way. They play fair, take turns mounting, chasing, and pinning each other down. They soothe each other when they are afraid, keep each other healthy with loving grooming and nibbling sessions, and most incredibly, respect each other's boundaries. It didn't happen overnight, but Titan and Socks have allowed each other control of certain aspects of their life together. Socks is in charge of toys, and Titan isn't to play with them without her permission. <laughs> Titan owns the couch and invites Socks onto it most of the time. Their food and treats are sacred, and neither dares take edibles away from the other. They never fight or growl. A simple look is all it takes for them to assert their position. Titan adores Socks, despite her tomboyish strut, chunky jowls, and loud snoring. He, he doesn't judge her when she acts out in public or licks herself inappropriately. <laughs> and Socks loves Titan, despite his prissy prance, tiny effeminate paws, and complete and utter neurosis. She's even patient with him on walks as he tries to mark everything in sight. I've always believed in the one and have no doubt that Titan and Socks have found their soulmate. So that's a story about learning to receive love that's subtle, you know, to establish boundaries and clear communication and sharing. I think these dogs do much better than I've done in marriages <laughs> by a long shot. So, when we think about a receiving love that is obvious or subtle, what grows our spiritual nature best? Is it best to pick up on the obvious actions of love, or is it um, a skill to really learn how to accept those subtle actions of love and attune ourselves to greater receptivity all the time so that everything that comes to us we can actually interpret as as love either skillfully given or not so skillfully given but love nonetheless and how would that be in our world if all of us were very very slow to take offense and instead looked for the best in everything that came to us so lastly I want to talk about proofs of love from God so when we look at proofs of love from God, sometimes we get what we want, and sometimes we get what we don't want. Now, a reminder and a review for the month is that God has given everything, all the time. And what we receive into our life is a court. This says, uh, trust your struggle, is what that, that says. That's an interesting photograph. But what I want you to focus on is that which we want and that which we do not want. Because whatever it is we have in our life, it is because of our consciousness 
and that accepts the experiences that we either choose, that we allow, or we resist. Because choosing and resisting are both choosing. It is putting energy out there about something. And when we do that, oh, I really, really, really want this, or I really, really, really don't want this, all that the divine law hears is this, and that's what we get. Because God loves and adores us and gives us whatever it is that is in our head, whether we are thinking and, and, and being delighted about what we are thinking and choosing, or whether we are fearing and being disturbed by what we are choosing, all God hears is, you know, they want something. And so it's like, here, babies, here, have that. Here, you want some loneliness? Have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, you want some abundance? Have that. You want lack? Yeah, have that. Just here, 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 you can have it all. So everything is a proof of God's love. Every single thing that we have in our lives. So if you have what you do not want, if you have what you do not want, it is because you have not mastered the skills of working with the creative law because there's no resistance in the universe to giving you what you do want. So I will ask you if that's in your life, again, to take a class, no matter how many classes you have taken, go in with that. I, I want to learn the creative law so I can get rid of this and accept this. Or see a practitioner and say, I want to get rid of this and accept this. I want to learn how to do that because there is a skill involved. And actually, when we look at which is more valuable to have what we want or what we don't want, it's the aggravation that gets us to a class, sometimes. It's the aggravation to heal what is wanting to be healed in our life that pushes us forward in our spiritual growth. So having what you do not want encourages you to learn about the creative process because it is true that it is done unto you as you believe. That is the truth. So at the very, very, very tail end of the conference, uh, uh, Dr. Ken Gordon, who is our community spiritual leader, uh, gave a really eloquent talk uh, with a big analogy of getting lost in the casinos. So in Planet Hollywood, where we were, it was one of the newer um, hotels, um, resorts, with big high-rise thing with a, an extensive casino. And, and the structure of the casino was such that you could not see outside. You know, you could wander in circles and think, where is the mall and where is outside? And, and then every time you came down from your room, you would try to find, you know, by leaving yourself little crumbs, you know, the pathway, you know, to the Starbucks or the pathway outside, and you would get lost inevitably. And he said, you know, that's so much like my mind. I know where I want to go, and I get lost. And so over and over and over again, we show our mind what to choose. We show our mind what to choose. And he said, the spiritual practice requirement is to make the right choice over and over and over again. Choose love rather than judgment and unity rather than separation. And then what I would add is to show what your choice is by your actions. Because remember, realization without actualization is merely entertainment. It doesn't move anything in the world. And what we're wanting to do is heal ourselves and heal the world. So it is a world that works for everyone, a world living in love, one heart and one thought at a time. I want to conclude with a poem by Hafiz, which is, um, you know, Hafiz, um, the Sufi monk, that he makes so many references so many sexual references in his love poetry, so many drunken references in his love poetry, because he has a passion for God that is like being drunk on love. And when he refers to the friend, it's always God. When he refers to the lover, it's always God. So this is a short poem called In a Treehouse. Light will someday split you open even if your life is now a cage. For a divine seed, a crown of destiny is hidden and sown on an ancient fertile plain that you hold title to. Love 
will surely bust you open into an unfettered, blooming new galaxy, even if your mind is now a spoiled mule. A life-giving radiance will come. The friend's gratuity will come. Oh, look again within yourself, for I know you were once the elegant host to all the marvels in creation. From a sacred crevice in your body, a bow rises each night and shoots your soul into God. Behold the beautiful drunk singing one from the lunar vantage point of love. He is conducting the affairs of the whole universe while throwing wild parties in a treehouse on a limb in your heart. So our piece for those of you that want to go even deeper than what we have done this morning, this is it. Make this your mantra. How can I show my love in this moment? When you're in the middle of traffic and you're late, how can I show my love in this moment? When someone is screaming in your face, how can I show my love in this moment? All of the hard places, how can I show my love in this moment? Join me for the inner work. God's love continually pours into us. And we recognize it and we receive it. We recognize every single thing in our lives as a proof of love. Why else would it be here except God so loves us and has given us this experience for our delight or for our learning, one or the other? Everything is a proof of love. And so as we take this divine love into us, into ourselves, our heart continues to open so that there are no walls between us no one can hurt us. No one can take from us. It's all love and it's all flowing. And as we open our hearts, we open our hands. And that act of love moves from our hands into embracing and healing, soothing and comforting, building and restoring. And that is how our love is shown, the proof of our love for everyone out there and all of us in here, one and the same in that divine flowing love. Blessed be.